Good morning, good morning, good morning from wherever you're watching. Glad to have you with us in the Digital Cathedral this morning. Uh, it's a special morning, and I'll tell you why in just a second. Take your Bible, if you will, if you have your Bible or your phone, whatever's handy, uh, and find Matthew chapter 23. We're going to begin this morning with chapter 23 of Matthew, and we're beginning a brand new series this morning that I'm really excited about starting. It's been brewing and uh, churning around in me for several weeks. And I think now's the time to launch it. The title of the, this new series is called Embracing Your Divinity. Embracing Your Divinity. So this will be part one. And it's going to be, right now as I see it, it's going to be a fairly long series. You never know when you get started into, these, uh, into this kind of study when we're getting into some, some areas maybe that are kind of unknown to a lot of us, how long it'll really go and all that we're going to see. But I think we're going to have a pretty good number of parts to it. I don't know that it will go as long as the, the series I did on living the Christ is us life. That was 39 parts. I don't know that we're going to go that long, but we're going to, we're going to get into this. And I hope that you really stick with me. I, I want, to, want to begin this morning, as I often do with a new series, especially a, a series that's going to have some depth. I'd like to begin the first two or three messages and talk to you a little bit about where you have come from, where we've come from on this journey. Uh, maybe where we're at right now and where it is that God would like to take us and expand this as we move forward. Now, one of the things that I'm really sensitive about uh, is that everybody that comes to the digital cathedral is not in the same level. We're not at the same place in our consciousness spiritually. We're different places in our journey. We're different places in our walk. And so what I want to make sure as we go into this is that I... I want to stay far enough ahead of you to lead you, but at the same time, for some of you that may not be as quite as developed in some of the areas, you're a little bit newer to all this, I don't want to get so far ahead of you that you lose sight of where we're going. So we're going to go, we're going to go slow, we're going to go practical as I can make this. I don't want this to be simply a theological study or a study of your beliefs. I want this to be something that actually transforms your life and raises the level of your perception about who God designed you to be from the very start. I think there's so much areas to uh, explore about, uh, about what God had in mind for the human race that we haven't even touched yet. So we're going to get into that in this series, Embracing Your Divinity. I looked up the word embracing this week, and it actually means to accept something willingly and enthusiastically. To accept something willingly and enthusiastically. I hope, I hope as this unwinds, and I don't want the word divinity to scare you. I, I, I think we, we have separated uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit off into a class of divinity, and we have failed to see that they have brought us into the perichoretic dance that we're actually joined to them. I don't want this word divinity to scare you or, or make you a little bit hesitant, like we're getting off into some crazy stuff. We're not. But I want you to be able to embrace. I want you to enthusiastically and wholeheartedly begin to put your uh, arms around and get your head around everything that we're going to get into as we talk about embracing your divinity. So what I would like to do this morning is to look at some of the words of Jesus and how he viewed religion. I remember I said the first three, four messages, I want to talk about where we've come from, a lot of us, most of us, where we may be at currently, and I'll get into that more next week, help you put a gauge on that. And then as the weeks unfold, we're going to push the boundaries out, we'll push the borders out to where I feel the Spirit of God is taking us today. So this morning I want to start with the words of Jesus and how he viewed religion. And then as we work through the passage we're going to find that he drops a spiritual bomb on them toward the end of the passage and actually gives a revelation of what I would like to cover in, in this series. So Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 9. Let me just read that, and then we're going to, we're going to start to, to move through that passage, verse by verse. But I want to lay a little bit more foundation first before I do it. But let me, let me read this scripture to get this planted in your mind. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, or because of that, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not according to their works, for they say, and they do not. Verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear, 
and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all of their works they do to be seen of men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. Verse 6, they love the best places at feasts, the best seats of the synagogue. Verse 7, greeting others in the marketplace. And they love to be called Rabbi, Rabbi. Verse 8, but you do not need to be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Verse 9, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. All right, now let's talk a little bit about where we've come from, where we're going. In our, in our individual, uh, in, in just our individual walk with the Lord. Every step forward, and I think you've, you've probably come to that place of understanding, that every step forward from where we used to be to where we are now, and with a forward look to where we're going to go, every step that the Father's destined always comes by grace. Grace is how He has brought us from where we were to where we are, and grace is going to take us where we need to go. Now, there's a lot of definitions of grace. So when you say the word grace, it might maybe bring up different things to different minds. But every definition of grace always includes the Father's favor. It always includes somehow interwining in the Father's love, His goodness. And it always talks about empowering us to do the will of the Father. And all of this comes uh, apart from any decision or any input that we can make into it. Grace is, is not dependent upon our choice or our decision. It is it is totally a gift, and it always includes, let me just say it again, it always includes the Father's favor, the Father's love, uh, the empowering of the Father, the goodness of the Father. It, it, it incorporates all of those elements into it, and it's something that He just gives to us, and it's independent of any decision that we make on our own or any input that we can have into it. So as our revelation of grace grows, as it expands... As your understanding of grace continues to broaden out, what you see, and, and you probably already have, is that the door opens wide to move along further on your journey. Now, I think there's, a, there's two strong verses that really lay this out for you, and it's in Ephesians chapter 2. So let me, let me just hop over to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, and let's, let's nail down these two verses. I think this, this illustrates well what we're saying about in this early step about we're always dependent on grace to bring us from where we were to where we are to where we're going. Grace always includes favor, always includes love. It includes empowering from the Father. It's always independent of our choice. It's an imputed gift that God has given to all men. We see in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul said this. He said, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Now, do you see the illustration there? Even when we were dead in trespasses, you did nothing. You made no decision. But here comes the love, the goodness, the favor of God. And He made you alive together with Christ because through grace you've been saved. Verse 6, And He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And verse 7 says, So that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So we see the working of grace as it brought us from where we were, dead in trespasses and sins, to where He made us alive in Christ by grace. You've been saved. And then He gives us a, a forward look as to what grace is actually taking us to. And He says that in the ages to come, it's going to take the ages to come to unfold and unwrap the, the, the depth of all that He has given us, everything that it entails. And that's what we're talking about in this series. This is a good snapshot. Ephesians 2, 5 and 7, if, 5 through 7. If you ever need a good passage of Scripture to teach on in your Bible study, your home group, your, uh, your home church, whatever you have going on, this is a good snapshot of grace and its eternal revelation. You were dead, but His favor, His goodness, and His love quickened you. How? By grace you have been saved. Let me just stop on this word grace for just a minute. Grace, I know what you learned in church, but let me just say, grace is not necessarily just a ticket to heaven, all right? That's, that's not what saved is. Saved is not just a ticket to heaven. You're, let, me, let me set your mind at rest this morning. Your eternity is secure. I absolutely believe that. The eternity of every man, woman, and child is, is secure in the future, as it was in the past before your spirit ever took on flesh. You were secure in the Father 
from time past. And I believe with all my heart that you're secure in the future. That's not what saved is about. Saved is the Greek word sozo. You've probably heard that word. If you've hung around church, you've probably heard that word many times. Sozo means to heal, preserve, rescue, to make whole. There's nothing in the definition about going to heaven in the definition of so sozo. The American church has made everything in this life about getting ourselves prepared to go back to where we came from, which is kind of ridiculous when you think about it. Why would God take us from where we were, send us here <clears throat> on a trial basis, hoping that we would do all the right things to get us safely back to where we came from? That's, that's very illogical. That's not why you're here. We're here to demonstrate and manifest the kingdom of God to make this planet as it is in heaven. That was God's design. That was God's purpose from the very beginning when he set Adam in the garden. He gave man the earth. He gave us jurisdiction and authority. And if, it's, if you don't like what's going on in the earth, don't blame God. It's man's responsibility. All right. And he's given us the authority and the ability to change. So what this whole saved thing is about is being able to move throughout the planet a, a healing uh, preservation, uh, rescue, making whole of every inhabitant upon the planet. Now what I want to do, I want to go back to this Matthew 23. We're going to go through this passage verse by verse because this passage illustrates so well the journey that, I, that many of us that are watching this morning on the Digital Cathedral or whenever you're picking up this, this video on YouTube, it shows so well that the path that many of us were on and then toward the end of the passage, he drops this truth bomb on how we're actually to see ourselves and how we are to live. All right, I got to say one more thing before I get into to going through this passage verse by verse. Some of you are going to struggle with what this series is going to bring to the table. I understand that. And you're going to struggle because it's going to be an elevation of your perception of humanity and who you are. That's why I want to go slow with this. I, I know that some of you are going to say, this really sounds, uh, this doesn't sound like anything I've ever heard in church before. This does not sound, uh, this almost sounds kind of new agey. You're kind of elevating man. No, I'm not elevating man beyond what God would have him to be. So I'm going to go slow and as I said, I want to go very practical in this. When I'm done with it, I hope that I've come to the table and brought you something that you can actually work out in life. So if you'll stay with me, just stay with me every week. Keep it, will you keep an open mind? Keep an open mind to what the Spirit of Truth will show you. And I believe your life will be changed for the better. And you'll be, you'll come to a higher level in understanding as you realize that revelation is progressive. You have progressed a long way, and we thank God for that. We thank God for all the progression that we've made, and we'll go through the progression that we've made in these nine verses of Matthew chapter 23. We thank God for that, but we haven't gone anywhere at, to where we need to end up. But Revelation is progressive. Once you open yourself, once you open your mind to seeing what always was, this, it's, it's like... And I, I, don't want to, I don't know a better word to use. It's almost like magic that all of a sudden the blinders come off and you're able to continue this awakening process on an exponential basis. And the more that you see and the more that you're open to see, the spirit of truth then has a right of way to come into your life and to continue to unveil to you greater depths. So all, all I'm asking you for is an open mind. If you have an open mind to truth, and you travel in and live in the revelation that you currently have, you're going to continue to see more. Peter said in, in 2, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, Peter said, I want to continually put you in reminder or in remembrance of the things that you know. And he said, I also want to break to you present truth. And that's what the Spirit of God is doing today. He is breaking out to believers all over the planet Present truth. What is present truth? Present truth is what the Holy Spirit is revealing now. It tends to come in waves. Have you noticed that over your walk with Christ? That at certain times, certain seasons, it seems like God is, is emphasizing certain things and it catches fire in the body of Christ and it spreads through and we got it. He's done that with grace 
since probably uh, 2000, the year 2000. Turn, the turn of the century, it seems like there was a, a wave of grace that began to come through the body of Christ. Uh, it wasn't a pure grace to begin with, but as revelation continued, as present truth unwound, the grace got more pure in its application and in its teaching and in its, its methodology until now we see grace probably bigger and stronger than we ever did, especially as it was first revealed to us around the turn of the century or, or 25 or 10 or 12. Whenever you got the first glimpse, that for you was present truth truth. It's, it's the fresh bread. It's the stuff that's hot off the press. It's, it's the current thing that the Spirit of God is, is showing us. Paul called it mysteries that are revealed. Paul said in Colossians, if you want, hold your finger right there in Matthew uh, chapter 23. Come over to Colossians. I want to read uh, three verses in the, in the phraseology, the wording that Paul put to present truth or what the Spirit of God is, is currently doing. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25 says this. He said, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. You got it? To fulfill the word of God, to bring truth, to bring revelation. He goes on in verse 26 and says, The word of God was the mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but is now being revealed to his saints, to them those saints God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of his mystery, or of this mystery among the Gentiles. And Paul says, here's the present truth. Paul said the Spirit of God is breaking present truth. Now listen, everybody Paul ministered to didn't get it. Some caught it years later. Some caught it a generation later. Paul said the mystery, the present truth, the wave that was coming through the body of Christ at that time was the mystery that was hidden from generations but is now revealed. There are mysteries that have been hidden from generations but are now being revealed to the body of Christ. This particular one that Paul emphasized was Christ in you. Now notice he's addressing that to the Gentiles. He's wanting the Gentiles to know those, those that were not really the, the, the believing force, those that were not the inside circle as religion would look at them. He said, I want the Gentiles to know this is a mystery that has been revealed, but the mystery is that Christ is in you. So this kind of truth, and you know, now we all accept that. Now we all can see that. I mean, there are, there are many evangelicals that still don't get it, that Christ is in everybody. They just haven't awakened to it. They don't know it yet. But you and I that are on the cutting edge of what the Spirit of God is doing today, present truth, we know it. We see it. And for us now, it becomes very obvious. So the Spirit of truth is raising our spiritual understanding and He's doing it for us directly. He's speaking directly to many lives today. There are people all around the world that are catching this outside of somebody really teaching them like I'm instructing you this morning, line upon lines. People are, are, are catching it. They're seeing it. All right. So embracing your divinity. Let's, what Jesus, let's look at what Jesus says about where you were. <clears throat> and times haven't changed very much. Where they were, many of us came out of. Just different names to where we were. Let me, let me show you. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 23 and let's look at that first verse. And let me walk through this with you verse by verse. Notice in Matthew chapter 23, verse 1, Jesus then spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples. Jesus spoke to the multitudes and the disciples. He spoke to the multitudes. I want to I want, take special note of that. Jesus was addressing two groups. His followers that had ears to hear and the general public. All right? Now that's important. He wasn't speaking to the clergy. He wasn't speaking to the theologically well-trained. He wasn't speaking to the theologians of the day. He wasn't speaking to the megachurch pastor. Nothing wrong with being a megachurch pastor if you understand current truth, present truth, and you're teaching it. But often... Often the scribes and the Pharisees and the megachurch pastor or the theologians, the scribes, they couldn't hear what Jesus was saying. And many today have a problem understanding what Jesus is saying. They know what Jesus said, but present truth now seems very foreign to them. So Jesus gathers this group of disciples and the general public around him and he begins to talk to them. And I think it's so noteworthy that he was, he was speaking to people that were not trained. 
He wasn't speaking to, to uh, uh, the leadership. Leaders hear things through filters. What Jesus said that the Pharisees heard through filters, the scribe heard through their religious filters. And what Jesus is saying today is being passed through evangelical filters, through Baptist filters, charismatic filters. And as it passes through that filter, it takes a bend. And it takes a bend toward what they would like for it to say. That's one reason why evangelical Christians depend so only, they refuse to move outside of the Bible to hear what Jesus is saying. They want to emphasize what he said because what he said, we can make say what we would like it to say. Much greater chance of that. So the spirit of truth has just kind of gone around that whole system. And he's speaking again to the general public and to the followers of Jesus. Those that have ears to hear. So it's not a very sophisticated group that Jesus is talking to. And what he's going to do in, in seven verses, I read nine verses. In seven verses, he's going to expose religion. And I want you, as I read through this, as we go through it verse by verse, I want you to see if you can relate to what Jesus said, to what you have come out of, and maybe some of you are watching, and you're still in what Jesus is going to lay out here, but there's something stirring inside of you that is pulling you out of it. I can tell you what's pulling you out of it. It's the spirit of truth. So, if you've never been involved in religion, it, there are, you know, there's always a, a, a drop of people that just come right into what God is doing, what the Spirit of God is saying, and they can bypass all of the junk and the garbage that most of us had to come out of. If that's you, you're very fortunate. I know two or three people that are really tuned into the things of God that have had no religious background, whatever. They were like the general public that Jesus was talking to. All right? they, they, they didn't have to get rid of junk. That's a fortunate place to be and not many of us were that fortunate. So what Jesus is going to do, he's going to pull back and he's going to expose, he's going to expose what looking back on, we wonder how in the heck did we ever get ensnared in it, but we did. And there are thousands of people still ensnared in what Jesus is going to expose. And the reason they're still ensnared in it is the reason we were ensnared in it is because the system we were in does not tolerate questions. It doesn't tolerate thinking outside of, the, outside of the, the paradigm of whatever that particular stream of belief is. Religion always thrives on pat answers. If you've been going to the same church, if you've been going to the Baptist church for 20 years, you know every pat answer to every question that is ever asked. And you know, you know the pat scripture that goes with the pat answer. It's a well-rehearsed scripture because you've heard it week after week after week for 20 years. So Jesus says, getting ready to expose this. All right? So he starts in verse 2 and he begins to expose the leadership of religion. In verse 2 he says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, what does that mean? The scribes and Pharisees, first of all, understand they're the professionals. They're the clergy. They're the, they're the reverends, right? Moses' seat that the scribes, that the leadership, that the clergy sets in, that seat is where the 613 laws emanated from. How did they get 613 laws out of 10 commandments? It's very simple. It's the same procedure that your denomination got all of the religious idiosyncrasies that you used to be involved in. 613 laws of Moses came to try to help people keep the 10. Now, I don't, the, the, the motivation might have been good to start with. Sometimes the motivation in religion is good to help people live a holy life. But after a generation or two, the suggestions and, and the motivation to help people move from being that to where it becomes setting concrete law and becomes sin if it's broken. So the 613 laws, many of which, if you broke, you could be killed, you could be stoned for. And they all, all came from the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, the professionals, 
The clergy set the right and the wrong. They set the good and the evil. They opened up wide this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The world of dualism, the, the world of right and wrong, good and evil, the world of a great power and a lesser power. It opened up all of this, this dualism. It, it, it opened up your separation from God and trying to get back to God. It, it separated out two powers. And to think about the scribes and the Pharisees and to think about professional ministry still today and denominational leaders is they are not to be questioned. That is the gist of what Jesus was getting at. I want you to look back on your religious training. Those of you that are like me that came out of years and years and years of religion. Wasn't all of the religion about training us what was right and what was wrong? What was good, what was evil? And what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was evil was always based on what church officials told you. It's what the scribes and the Pharisees told them with the 613 laws. So everything that church officials taught us about good and evil, right and wrong, not to be questioned, they taught because frankly, they had been taught. And those that taught them taught what they taught to them because they had been taught. So it just passes down the line. And so from the scribes and Pharisees till today, we have got this thread of legalism and rule keeping that has maintained itself right on through the religious quest. And Jesus, Jesus said, the scribes and the Pharisees, so he throws up a red flag. He said, those guys, he said, you have to be careful for. Then in verse 3, he says this. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and they do not do. So what's Jesus saying there? All right, listen. Listen closely. Jesus is saying, if you want to get involved in religion, jump into it with both feet. If you want to get involved in rule keeping, jump into it with both feet. Whatever you are instructed and taught about religion and rule keeping and legalism. He said, do it. But then he throws in a caveat and he says, do everything they teach, but don't follow their example because they tell you to do, but they themselves don't do. So he's saying, don't set the religious leader. Don't set, don't set the professionals. Don't set the guy with the spotlights and the limelight up as a leader, as the gold standard, because that whole system is flooded with hypocrisy. And what they say and don't do eventually is going to bring you discouragement. So if you want to get involved in religion, and this is what I would, I would say the same thing to you as, as, as Jesus said to the public then, if you want to get involved in religion, rule-keeping, legalism, try to earn favor with God, go for it. Jump into it with both feet. But the caveat is still the same. Don't set anybody up as the gold standard. Don't set the pastor or the apostle, the prophet. Don't set them on a pedestal. Because as soon as you see inconsistencies, as soon as you see what they say but they don't do, it'll bring discouragement to your life. So that one verse tells you why there are a lot of people, millions of people, that are turned off with church, turned off with religion, turned off uh, to everything they have been taught, anything that, they, uh, that is associated with what they've been taught, because they have observed the leaders doing exactly what Jesus said in verse 3. They have seen pastors, they've seen elders, telling people how to live and what to do, but they themselves don't do it. And so when that behavior is observed, you remember back in the 80s when we had all of the, the, the uh, scandals with the Bakers and the Swaggerts and there were several others, the uh, Marvin Gorman, there were several others that were involved and all of a sudden all of that mess was exposed. What a discouragement it was to so many Christians. Many just walked away from their faith entirely because their faith was invested in those that they had set on pedestals. Now, if you want to follow what a man teaches, you fine. But don't set him on a pedestal because he's going to disappoint you. And that's what Jesus is getting at, all right? So Jesus says, first of all, 
He says, the scribes and the Pharisees, they said any seats of judgment, they said any seats of rule keeping, law making. But the problem is what they tell you to do, the laws they set up, they, they put on you, but they don't do themselves. Now, verse four through seven, Jesus exposes and lays bare the motivation of what religion is all about. So I'm going to read four to seven as one passage of scripture. Here he lays the motivation of religion. Now, I, I'm laying all this down this morning because I want you to see where you've come from. Once in a while, we need a refresher because once, you, once you're disengaged from it and there's some time lag, you forget. I'm refreshing your mem memory this morning to show you how much God has worked in your life, how much the Spirit of Truth has taught you, what grace has flushed out of you already or is currently flushing out. All right, verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear. This is the motivation. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move one of their fingers to move the burden. For all their works they do to be seen of men, they make their phylacteries broad, enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogue. They love the greetings in the marketplace, and they love to be called by titles. Rabbi, Rabbi. Does that sound at all familiar? Now, when you're, when you're in it, you don't, even re, you don't even recognize it. I didn't. I didn't recognize all that was going on. And I saw so much of this motivation, this, this pride, this self-exaltation, this attitude that is demonstrated of some, some are just a little better than others. When, when grace and love begins to free you, you look back on that mess and it makes you wonder what it was that hypnotized you. What was it that mesmerized you that you didn't see it sooner? Let me drop way down to verse 33. Jesus called these guys that did all of this. He said, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of Gehenna, that garbage dump. How can you escape the condemnation that's going to come on you when you are cast in that garbage dump that is a fire that burns with decaying animals and bodies where maggots and worms are consuming that dead flesh, which was going to be the future of the Jews when Rome came through in 70 AD and began to, to totally overrun the capital and destroy the temple. Therefore, he says in verse 34, Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets. I send you wise men and scribes. Some of them you'll kill and crucify, and some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Jesus always saved his best barrage of angry words for religious leaders who absolutely knew what they were doing. And when somebody begins to rock the system, Jesus said in verse 34, I'm sending you people that will warn you. Try to get you turned around. Try to open your eyes. Try to shake you out of this. But he said, you don't receive them. And he said, some you'll crucify and some you'll scourge. And the same thing goes on today. Here's what they did when somebody shook the boat. And here's still what religion does to those of us that are shaking the boat today. They crucify you, they scourge you, they set you apart, they do whatever they can to distance you. This verses four through six, Jesus lays out not only the motivation of what religion is all about, he exposes the hierarchical hypocrisy to the bone. He says they lay heavy burdens on you, but they themselves will do nothing. And the reason they lay heavy burdens on you is to control you. If I can lay down enough laws and, and rules and regulations and convince you that you must keep them to please God, to be accepted in His eyes, I then can begin to hammer you every week. And a lot of us came out of a weekly hammering by the pastor. And some of us, look how perverse this is. Some of us would even go to the pastor after the, after the service and say, Pastor, that was a wonderful sermon. You stepped all over my toes. You sure hit me today. You hit me right between the eyes. 
You, you just got all over my business today. You got up in my bit. You got all over my case today. That, it was like we're saying, beat me again. Beat me again. I love it so much. And we went in every week and got our beating. And we loved it. Some people loved it. When, back in the day when I used, to, I used to really hammer on stuff, I would have people come and say, that was the best sermon I ever heard. You just, you just beat me to a smithereen. You just beat the stuffing out of me. And they had a big old smile on their face like they really enjoyed the beating. That's, that's the hierarchical hypocrisy of this. They tell you what to do, but they themselves don't keep the standard or the level. They have giant egos and motivation to be seen and to be praised. They love the, Jesus lays it out in, in, in what is it, verse 7. He says, uh, verse 6, they, they love the best places at the feast and the best seats in the synagogue. Have you ever seen, have you ever been a part of a, of a charismatic church where the special speakers don't come in during praise and worship? They're back somewhere else, hidden off. And once the service is going, here comes the procession. Here, here comes the armor bearers carrying the man's Bible. Like he doesn't have enough strength to carry his own Bible. And where are they brought? Are they taken to the back row? No, they love the best seats. They're brought straight down in the front so everybody can see them. It's a big deal. It's a procession. They love the best front row seats. They're ushered in by armor bearers after the service starts. I, back in the day, I used to have speakers tell me, let's just stay in the office till about 30 minutes into praise and worship, and then we'll go into the service. Well, why don't we just go in and praise and worship with everybody else? They love public recognition and titles. There are titles today coming up I've never heard of in all my life. I've got Facebook friends now that aren't just claiming to be bishops. They are, they're not Catholic, but they are archbishops. Oh yeah. I have friends that are not now just prophets. They're master prophets. And I've got apostle friends that are no longer just satisfied with being an apostle. They are chief apostles. Jesus just unwinds this whole system. And when you're in it, either you don't recognize it or you just think this is the way this whole thing rolls. And I think probably in Jesus' day, they were in the same, same situation. All right, now here's where I wanted to go. I've said all that to say this. In verses 8, 9, and 10, Jesus sets the house in order. First seven verses, he lays bare to the bone and exposes the hypocrisy of not only religion, but the motivation of religious leaders. Now watch how he starts verse 10. He said, but you, you followers and you that are in the public, that's who he's talking to, do not be called rabbi. For one is your teacher, the Christ, and you're all brethren. Verse 9. Do not call anyone on, on, on the earth your father. For one is your father, which is in heaven. All right, now verse 10. And don't be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. Wow, what a, now watch, he's taking a dramatic shift. You see what he's done? The first seven verses, he exposes religion, religious leaders. He exposes the burdens, the laws, the regulations that have been placed on you. Then in verse 8, to his disciples and to the public, he says, don't, and he, I can bet Jesus is wagging his finger. Don't any of you ever be called rabbi. In other words, don't get mixed up or strive to become involved in that system. Stay clear of it. Now, he goes on to say in verse 10, he said, you've got one teacher and that's Christ. I want to ask you a question. There's one teacher. He said, don't call anybody teacher. You've got one teacher which is in Christ. Now, I want to ask you something. This is a huge difference between what you've encountered in the grace and the finished work conclusion message than what you had in your charismatic, Pentecostal, Baptist, evangelical days. Religion would never release you to be taught by Christ directly. What's going on today is that the Spirit of Truth 
teaching people directly. Whatever it is that you came out of would tell you that you need the rabbi. You need the pastor. You need the prophet to teach you and give you direction. Jesus said, I'm releasing you to know that there's only one teacher you got, and that's the Christ. Think back now in your religious days. Were you ever encouraged or, 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 or uh, pushed at all to learn directly from Jesus or from the Spirit of Truth? Or were you always tied to a system and to the rabbi, the superstars of that system to get your information? Why do you think thousands of people, nothing against Kenneth Copeland or, or Believer's uh, conventions. I've been to many of them. But they would flock to those conventions to hear what Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savell, whoever the list of speakers were speak. And they brought some great teaching. I'm not saying that. But every, most of the people that came to those were not tuned in to hear for themselves. They were there to hear what somebody else said and then embrace it as the truth. And Jesus is teaching us. He's weaning us off of that. Does that mean I don't listen to people? No, I listen, I listen to YouTube. I listen to teaching. I read books. I'm wide open, but listen to me. I know that ultimately there is one that reveals truth to me, and it's the Christ. In verse, 11, in verse 8, he just levels the playing field. He says, don't call anybody rabbi. And here he levels the field because you're all brethren. There is nobody that has a leg up on anybody. All right? Now, I want you to get this down because where we're going in embracing your divinity, you got to see this. Nobody has a leg up on anybody. We are all brethren. There's no hierarchy. There is none of this nonsense of you need a covering from some man in order to function, telling you what you can do and what you can't do. Then in verse 9, he throws a wrench in the whole thing. Now watch verse 9. He throws a wrench in there and he pops in a mind-blowing truth that the church still fights today. And this is why religion has ingrained us to where it's hard, even for some of us that are listening here in the digital cathedral, I had one lady that is really into grace and she has great understanding. She told me this week, she said, when you announced that title, I struggled with it. And she said, I realized it was because of how deep the claws of religion really had a hold of me. And this is a lady that's very mature, great lady. But this is the mind-blowing truth. Now look at this in verse 9. He says, don't call anyone on earth your father. Now this is, this is going to get deep. For one is your father... He who is in heaven. Now, talking about in, 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 in embracing your lineage there. He said, don't call any man on earth your father. Now, Jesus isn't disrespecting your earthly parents. Get that straight. He's not telling you don't disrespect them. Jesus was all in agreement with showing respect to mothers and fathers. He demonstrated that when he was on the cross. He looked at the apostle John and said, John, I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, John, I want you to take care of my mother the rest of her life. And he said, Mom, I want you to see John. There's your new son right there. He's going to take care of you. All right. So Jesus made sure his mom was taken care of. So Jesus wasn't saying disrespect your parents. What he was saying, what he was talking about, when he said, don't call any man father, small f, for you have one father, capital F, which is in heaven. He's talking about your source of being. He's talking about the point of your origination. He's talking about the giver of your life. Whose life flow, Whose life is it that flows through your veins, really? He's talking about family connection. When we talk about embracing your divinity, we're talking about embracing your point of origination and not seeing yourself lesser than your Father, which is in heaven. Now, I, st I respect my earthly father. Always did. Love my earthly father. But I never saw my earthly father as greater than me. I saw us as one together. We were, we were bone of bone, blood of blood. I mean, we're family, right? And what he's trying to get across to us is that 
you have the same stuff making you up that makes the Father up. You have, you have the same DNA. You are eternal spirit. You always existed and you always will exist. You are eternal spirit. You are irrevocably, eternally one with your source. Now watch this. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 2 and 7 says, Father, you made them, or you, God, made them, us, a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor. Now I've got, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up, but I've got to take you back to Psalm chapter 8, which is the origination of what was being quoted here in Hebrews chapter uh, 2 and verse 7. Let me get you over to Psalms chapter 8. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn there. I want you to underline and make a note uh, out in the column. Look what it says in Psalm chapter 8 and verse 4. What is man that you're mindful of him? And all the sons of man that you visited him. For you have made him, man, a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. Now, I want you to come up in verse 5, and I want you to underline the word angel. That word angel is a, as bad a translation of a word as could have ever been made. The word angel there, and you can go get your Strong's Concordance or whatever source you want to get. The word angel there in Psalm chapter 8 is actually the word, listen, it's the word Elohim. Elohim, which is God himself. What does the writer of the Psalm say? He says, what is man that you're mindful of him? That you made him just a little lower than Elohim. When you came into the earth, you were of the God kind but like Jesus, you've got to grow in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Didn't Jesus grow? Was Jesus as much God when he was in the crib as when he was crucified? Absolutely. But Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Your eternal spirit of the God kind. And as plain as plain can be that God created you and made you mindful within himself that you are Indeed, Elohim. Now, the translators couldn't deal, I, I'm, I'm convinced, couldn't deal with man thinking of himself on that level. And it's still, it's still a problem in the church today when you begin to talk about man on that level. So they took the word angels and, and placed it in instead of Elohim. Man's created position. And every son of man that has been birthed into the earth is that of Elohim, this man, us, has now manifested in the flesh. I am just spirit. I like the way Kay Fairchild says this. I am spirit slowed down to visibility. That's who I am. The flesh is not who I am. Now Jesus said another thing, and it, religion has a hard time with this divinity thing. In, in John chapter 10, Jesus hit it head on. In John chapter 10 and uh, verse 33, look at, look at religion's response to Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 33, they've got Jesus, they're questioning Jesus. He's going to be crucified. And the Jews answered Jesus and said, for a good work we don't stone you, but we stone you for blasphemy because you, being a man, have made yourself God. Jesus said, really? He said, isn't it written in your law that you are gods? Now, religion today will, 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 will crucify you and want to stone you when you bring man to his place of Elohim, to his place of actual divinity. They'll teach you to have authority and dominion over the earth, but how do you do that? If you, if, you don't, if you don't have a place of divinity, how do you take authority? It's Him coming through you and living as you, as you recognize your real source and your oneness with that source and that, didn't Paul, didn't Paul say that you are, Peter said, what is it, 1 Peter 1 and 3, 
that you are a partaker of the divine nature, right? So that, that puts you into that class. So this is where we've came, come from. A lot of us have come through those first seven verses of Matthew chapter 23. We started with religion and he points out all the mess. Then he brings us to this truth of who we are, which is divinity. Religion is trying to keep you in a position of trying to reach the Father. Embracing your divinity enables you to live from the Father. Have you got the difference? So every person that's watching me today, I don't care what country you're in, you're somewhere in between being stuck in religion and being released into embracing your divinity. Manifesting as sons of God. How can you be a son of God and not have the same nature of God? bringing the kingdom into visibility. And it is a journey. It is a journey. So next week, what I want to do next week, I want to examine the journey and help you pinpoint where it is you are on the journey and the next spe steps you can expect to take as you move forward on the journey. Next week's going to be something else. You don't want to miss it. All right, Wednesday night, we'll take this. We'll talk about it, break it down and go a little bit deeper with it. I think that's enough for one day. God bless you. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for your contributions, your love and support. And we'll see you next Sunday morning on the Digital Cathedral. You guys have a great week. In Jesus' name.